There's a little boy, about four or five years old, who wanted to surprise his father with breakfast in bed one day to show his appreciation. And so while his father was still sleeping, the boy was hard at work in the kitchen, prepping all of the food. And when he had it all prepared, he put it all on a tray and went down the narrow hallway and, and went into the room where the door cracked and kind of got it open and woke up his father and surprised him. And his father was delighted. And he looked down, and it was everything you'd expect a four or five-year-old to have. It was a bowl of cereal overflowing uh, with, with milk and with cereal. And then on the side, you had very burnt toast. And then you had two or three slices of cold bacon that came out of a package. And then, you know, and the, the father didn't really care about the quality of the meal. He was just, he was uh, so, so appreciated the gesture. But then the boy had the biggest surprise of all, which was a new mug that said, World's Best Dad on it. And the father took the mug, he's so delighted, he looks down and there's this strange brown liquid inside of the mug. Kind of looked like a mixture of, of chocolate milk and who knows what, all kind of mixed in there, maybe a Fruit Loop kind of floating in there. Uh, and the little boy looked at him and, and the father said, the father asked the boy, he said, well, what's in the mug? He's asking me, he's like, well, father, dad, it's your favorite. It's the coffee, just the way you like it. Go ahead, take a drink. And so the father, not wanting to disappoint his eager son, began to, to drink from the mug. He took a little sip and it would, tasted exactly like it looked. And of course, he didn't want to drink much more. And he looked at the boy and the boy said, go on, dad, keep drinking, keep drinking. And the father continued to, to drink and to enjoy his morning cup of coffee, and he drank about halfway through the mug. And as he was drinking, he noticed there was something green starting to emerge from the little mug. And the father was a little startled by that, and he said, son, what is this green thing in the mug? He said, you got to continue drinking to find out. It's a big surprise. And so fa the father continues drinking until he identifies what it is. And it's a little green soldier sticking out of the mug. And the father says, son, why did you put a little green soldier in the mug? He said, you know, dad, it's like the model. The best part of waking up is soldiers in your cup. <laughs> so if you got our coffee this morning, I want you to know there's a little green army man in your cup. No, we just have soldiers, no soldiers today. So we've been in this series as we've been talking about being this one another community. And in doing so, we've been talking about the difference between individualism and collectivism and all that kind of goes with that. If you're joining us today, I'm sorry, we won't go through all of what that was uh, and what we went through. But basically, right, an individualist in a Western society such as the United States, Canada, or places in Europe like the UK, we tend to view ourselves more as individuals separate from a community. And if we're part of a community, it's that we've given ourselves to that willfully. But collectivist cultures, such as country, countries more in Eastern societies, like China, Middle Eastern countries, India, and many Hispanic cultures, will often think of themselves more as a community that sends off individuals. So yes, I'm an individual, but most of their identity is rooted in community. Now, there's not a, a good or a bad from that. Both, as we saw last week, both ways of viewing the world have strengths and weaknesses. And as we established last week, Jesus actually calls, has a calling for both individualists to entrust themselves fully to a community, selflessly, but also he has a calling for collectivist cultures to get up from their communities and give themselves more fully to the community of God. And so the calling of Jesus uh, is high for both. But in the story that I shared this morning about the little boy, the problem in that story was the boy had a good heart, but he just had some misinformation about what his father actually wanted in the cup. Uh, he had the goal, but it was misdir a misdirected goal. And here's where individualism kind of comes in, is individualists, as individualists, we, well, let me say this, we set our goals based on our cultural worldview. And that's shaped by the way in which we view the world. And that pans itself out differently for individualists and collectivists. For interest, for, for interest, for, um, or for instance, I should say, uh, uh, the, that a 
Individualists, one way that we might set a goal is as we think of ourselves as individuals and we think of ourselves uh, and our goals individually rather than communally, when we come to church, we might think of our goal as sort of this, and, and this is a bit of a parody of maybe what a goal would look like, but coming from an individual's culture, we might say, I want to be a good person and pass the test of God's judgment to secure my place in heaven one day. And perhaps that's the goal of the spiritual life and relationship with Jesus is I've got to reserve my spot in heaven. And, and maybe that's how some view. I know growing up, that's sort of my impression and sort of how I thought of, of faith in some ways. And, and not that all of this is bad per se. Obviously, those are good thoughts to want to be a good person and want to be in heaven with the Lord. All those are good. But here's my point is as an individualist goal, it's somewhat misdirected. And I think that causes us to ask misdirected questions when we come to community. For instance, when this is the goal, it leads to questions like this. When we come to a church, a community, a local church, we say, will this church meet my needs? And maybe you push back on that a little bit and say, well, shouldn't the church be a place where we grow? And if we're not growing, you know, we shouldn't be a part of that church. And, and you know, I'm not debating any of that. I'm not pushing back on any of that. Absolutely, you need to be a place where you grow. But we're going to come back to this thought towards the end of the lesson. So hold on to this question. Will this church serve my needs? And we'll bring it to the end as we close. But in order to provide meat to our discussion this morning and what it means to truly, as individuals, invest ourselves into community and a real, last week as we talked, a real incarnational in the flesh community, that truly where we are able to share ourselves. I want to go to Ephesians 4 today and look at that passage. But before we do it, kind of looking at Ephesians as a whole and looking at what Paul, early church planter who wrote the letter of Ephesians, uh, was talking about when he uh, gets to the passage that Grady read for us this morning. And so let's provide some context. And the first thing I want to do is provide some context about the division between Jews and Gentiles. Because the church in Ephesus was probably predominantly a Gentile church. However, there would have been Jews kind of scattered all over the, the Greco-Roman world. And there would have been a, probably a Jewish element among the church at Ephesus. Hence why we see a lot of the issues going on that Paul is addressing to Ephesus and, and to other churches as well, especially churches like um, the church in Galatia, uh, where the book of uh, Galatians is written. So a, a Jew was a, someone who had descended from the 12 tribes of Jacob. And historically, as far as we look at the biblical world, like the Jews were understood to be God's chosen people. It was a relatively small group compared to the rest of the world, but they were considered right, God's exclusive special people. And then the term Gentile, which simply means the word, it just means the nations, the phrase the nations, which just simply means all the other people who are not Jewish, who are not included in those who have descended from the 12 tribes of Jacob. Now, Gentiles could become what we call God-fearers. They could uh, reorient their life to serve Yahweh, the name of God. They could serve the God of Israel. However, they would never... Uh, be included in the actual community. What I mean by that is they could not enter the temple. There were certain parts that they were not allowed to go into and to be a part of the community. However, when Jesus came, he overturned all of this. And instead, he, he opens things up and calls all people to the community. In fact, he says, or Paul says this in Ephesians 2 and verse 14, For Jesus himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the, the, the dividing wall of hostility. In the next verse, he talks about that wall being the Old Testament law and some of the rules and regulations that went with that. Because as you would imagine, as you think about the division between these Jews and Gentiles, you can see the hostility because there was a lot of different cultural laws included in that, including what you ate, how you dressed, um, who you associated with, all those type of things that had to do with their, their purity and, and coming into the temple and the, all those type of things. And so it was very offensive to them when they would be around Gentiles not living the same sort of life. Circumcision, of course, is the big marker that fell into this category of how they consider Jew and Gentile and the, sort of the division and hostility. And you see that particular issue kind of coming in and causing a lot of divisions uh, in the churches, especially like in the church of Galatia, where, where that takes place. But here's Paul saying is, listen, 
Jesus has removed that. And now the two groups are one. And he continues on. He says in verse 16, And in one body Jesus has reconciled both of them to God through the cross, by which he put uh, to death their hostility. In other words, all people are welcome. Gentiles are now welcome into the community of God, which, by the way, that probably includes like 99% of us in this room today, as we would have been excluded outside of the kingdom of God, but now we're invited in. Even if we were able to, to devote ourselves to God as God-fearers, we still were not able to come into the most intimate places to commune with God, but now we can through the cross of Christ. Paul continues on in verse 18, For through Jesus, him, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by the one Spirit. And so God brings the community, his community together. He brings all, he even says, I believe in verse 17, this one new humanity, these two groups bringing them into one new humanity, as all people are invited to be a part of this community that we have been talking about. And what's so interesting is it says that as we're all brought in, that we're actually being built up together. As, as we, the church, are being built up together through the Spirit. And in verse 21 it says, For in Jesus the whole building, talking about the body of Christ, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. The Gentiles who want, were once excluded from being in the most intimate places of the temple and the temple worship are now being built up as a part of the new temple with the Jews coming together in union and unity uh, to become the temple of God. Now what's that mean? That's an odd thing. It's sort of an odd metaphor to say that we're becoming the temple of God. What well, means this is that there's no true temple anymore, but the church, wherever it is, is a place where people can come and access God. It's open to all. And as all people commit themselves to Jesus, they become part of that building. They're, they're engrafted in. They're, they're built in as, as we're building this temple to God, or we're being built into a temple, I should say, to God. And then verse 22, it says, And in Jesus, you too... He's talking to this Gentile Jewish church, but predominantly Gentile. You two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives in by His Spirit. In other words, you're no longer excluded from the deepest places of the presence of God, but now the presence of God is in the deepest places of you, individually and communally. And what this passage is really teaching is communally. Now, there's other passages that teach that the Holy Spirit indwells us as individuals, like in Romans 8. But then you have passages like this, that, that we also experience God's presence in a very unique way when we come together with all of our diversity and differences, different life experiences, and we come together, being built up together into the temple of God. And so when we commit ourselves to Jesus, pledge allegiance to Him as King, or baptize into Christ, receive the Holy Spirit, we have this unity with one another. We're being built up together as a temple where people can come and experience God together. So as we think about that, the unity of the church, I want to think about that for just a moment. Because there's different ways to think about the unity of the church. But Paul, as we kind of jump into our, where we're going this morning... Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 and verse 1. He says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, before, our, you know, before looking at this lesson, I would have thought more of our calling, like follow Jesus, like that's the calling. He's talking about deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Yeah, that's included. But what he's talking about contextually is this calling to be built up as the temple of God. That all Jews and Gentiles are called together to set aside really important differences and to become this temple of God where God's presence can be experienced by all in the world and all can come to him. That that's the calling, this call to unity, this call to be one. And that's difficult sometimes, isn't it? To maintain unity. Community is difficult. I appreciate Clint so much for being open and transparent. But this is a difficult thing. It's not an easy thing to be called to true community. And it comes with all sorts of challenges. And it's, as we think about one, as Clint identified, just us personally giving of ourselves to community, that's one aspect that's difficult to all of this, of sharing of ourselves, opening it up and letting other people in. That's, that's difficult and hard. But also, keeping unity with one another is very difficult. Kind of another side of the coin is not fighting with one another. 
if I had to guess, most people in this room have had some sort of experience with division within churches. Maybe at some point in your, in your life, I have. And if maybe not, you've at least seen some ugly relationships at times, or you've witnessed it in other churches, right? We all have some sort of experience where that's happened. So we know that to have unity, this, this calling that we have to be one, it's not an easy thing at all. But as Paul says here, he says, be completely humble. He, he recognizes that this is, this is hard. He said, be completely humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love to complete this calling, to be the temple of God to the world, to be the representation, the light to the world of God's presence and goodness. But this is difficult. It's hard. It's challenging because, you know what? Me as an individual, sometimes I'm not humble. Sometimes I'm not gentle. Sometimes I'm not patient. And sometimes I'm not patient enough to bear with the person who's frustrating me within the community, within our church. And perhaps you've been there as well. We're human. We mess up. Although we want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's not always lined up with our heart in, it, in certain moments. And so that's what makes community hard, is that we're human. We have our own desires. We have our own feelings. And we get frustrated sometimes with one another. And so this is work. It's not meant to be easy. And that's what Paul then says. Like, this is the work we are called to. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Some of your translations say, be eager, be zealous. Make every, but I like the, the way the NIV puts it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of the peace. This is your calling. And this is not how I used to look at this passage. I did not see unity as being the central point of the passage, even though Paul couldn't say it any clearer. He said, this is your calling. Be humble. Be kind. Bear with one another in love. Keep the unity of the Spirit. Make every effort to do so. And here's what I've come to learn from this passage is this. Is that unity is not just ideal. It is part of the deal. It is part of what we sign up for when we decide, I'm going to commit my life to Christ, pledge allegiance to Him as King, and do my best to live out His will on earth as it is, as it is in heaven in my own life. That with that comes community. Now, why I say ideal, because sort of the impressions I got growing up, and others um, probably have had this experience as well, and certain parts of our fellowship, it kind of seems like we talk about unity in this big thing like, it's wonderful when brothers dwell together in unity, but that's sort of like this ideal that rarely actually happens, right? Like unity was, it's, if we agree with like a hundred propositions of truth, a hundred propositions of what we call doctrine, then we can have unity. But you know, like I do, we rarely ever actually agree on all those really quote unquote important things. And so it's just an ideal. We'll experience it one day in heaven, but it's sort of this ideal. We're never going to fully see it. And so that's why division becomes almost routine. And it almost doesn't phase us anymore when we see churches divide because we're just so used to it. Right? Uh, when you look at just down the road, you see church after church after church. And we might like, like to ideally think like, yeah, that's just their, them adding their own flavor to whatever. But that's historically not true, right? It's not just churches are made for different people, but those were born out of division after division after division. And we, by the way, in our fellowship are just as guilty as that in creating division, not maintaining the unity and the bond of peace. But it's now, as we look at the church, I don't say that to judge. I say that to say that's not ideal. Right? That's not what we were called to. We're called to more. And we in our fellowship, we're called to more as well. It's not just ideal, it's part of the deal. We think if we get all these other things lined up, then we can be in unity with one another. And Paul flips it. He says, no, if you have committed yourself to Christ, and you're a follower of Jesus, you've pledged allegiance to him as king, you've become part of the universal body, then you have unity. Whether you know the person sitting on the other side of the pew with you or not, you are unified through the blood of Christ and through the fact that you have the gift of the Holy Spirit within you. 
And what he would say then is make every effort to maintain that unity. He doesn't call us to create unity. He doesn't call us to check each other out and make sure we line up in all these areas to to make sure we can be brothers or not. No, he says you have unity if you've committed yourself to Jesus and the Holy Spirit's within you. Therefore, make every effort to maintain it. That's how important this is. Because we're being built up together into this temple of a reflection of God to the world where we send light to the world. Jesus, as we saw in other, other lessons, right? Jesus says, love one another, and that's how the world's going to know you're my disciples. Like, that's how important this is. They need to see that God is working in your life and among your community. All right, so unity is not just ideal. It's part of the deal. Now, as we think about that, there's difficulties. We struggle to get along, but God continues to call us. Be humble, be patient, be kind. The church in the first century dealt with some really big issues, some issues for them that were issues of identity, right? What you ate, how you dressed, how you went about your life, right? As Jew and Gentiles came together. But Paul tells them over and over again, is you got to set those things aside, put Christ in the center. That's easier said than done, amen, right? That's difficult, that's hard for us to do, but that's the challenge of unity, of, of keeping and maintaining unity. And so God creates unity, our task is to maintain it, right? And unity should be a priority over, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the core teachings of the gospel don't matter. They do, but oftentimes, right, we, we make the issues over things that are not the core teachings of the gospel. Those things are important, but unity does not take a second seat to that. Right? It doesn't take the back seat. It takes the forefront. It's the priority, and we try to work the other things out. Now, that doesn't mean there's not difficult conversations that need to be had at times and and things that need to be said as we try to to put Jesus in the center of all things. But the point is, unity is not just the ideal, it's part of the deal. And then the other side of this, too, is unity takes priority to growth as well. Unity is not, takes priority to evangelism at times, right? Jesus says, love one another so people will know you're my disciples. And the implication is that they will come to know God, right? But we have to focus first on keeping and maintaining the unity we have, that that takes a certain priority as we give ourselves to one another. That doesn't mean we don't focus on the other. As we see, as, as we kind of look at the trajectory of this year, we're going to emphasize some on how do we go out? How do we, how do we make a difference in the lives of other people? How do we call them into this fellowship, this unity? Right? But it starts with the church being the church and the church being this community, this one another community that truly does practice love towards each other and, and gets over our differences and, and overcomes the obstacles of, of division. And if we do that, if we love one another like Jesus calls us to, then what I want to say next is I think that other things will come. Because here's, I heard a preacher say one time, healthy things grow. And I think that's true. Uh, A couple years ago, Cassidy and I were trying to plant a little garden in like a little planter's box, like a small planter's box. And in that, we we had no idea what we were doing. We just bought some seeds from Walmart, planted them in there, expected to water it every day, expected to grow. Well, there's obviously a little bit more that you got to do. We didn't know anything. We didn't know how to get something started, how to get a seed starter, any of that. So we just planted it. And like after a few days, we started to see some growth. Like it was kind of like emerging out of the soil and we're super excited. But then it reached a certain point. I don't remember what the item was, what it was that we had planted, maybe some onions or some cucumbers or something. And it just started sticking up out of the ground. And we're thinking, this is great. We kept doing it, but nothing happened because we didn't know how to cultivate the growth. And so it looked like growth was happening, but in reality, it didn't have any nutrition. It didn't have what it needed to, 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 to flourish or to grow. And so it didn't. It wasn't healthy. We didn't know how to take care of it well. But when you do, because I know many of you, you have thriving gardens. You know how to maintain a garden. I don't. Uh, and you have great, um, a great harvest, and, and fruit comes from it. Vegetables come from it. But it takes that work. It takes cultivating healthy soil, cultivating a healthy plant. Healthy things grow. In the same way, when we get the one anotherness right, and I think we do that so well here in Northeast. That was one of the things that attracted Cassidy and I to come here. But when we get that well, we do it well, healthy things grow. And so that's where we come to the passage real quickly. In Ephesians 4, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers 
to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. In other words, ministry isn't just for church leaders. It's not just for, for, for preachers. It's not just for uh, youth ministers. It's not just for elders, deacons, or even just Bible classes. Like, ministry is the work of the church. And the responsibility of the church is to make sure that our church, our local church, is being built up, is equipped to go out and to serve and to do the work of ministry, to, to internally serve one another, internally be equipped to be this one another community that we're called to be. And eventually that works itself out, but it starts inward and then goes outward. Verse 13, it says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole <clears throat> measure and the fullness of Christ. So we're all striving towards maturity, being more conformed to the image of Christ. An easier way to say that is to be more like Jesus, that we're all working towards that goal, but we're doing it together. And then verse uh, 14, then we'll no longer be infants tossed uh, back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Now, Paul's not talking about some new program, and we haven't done it that way, so we can't do it, and that's a new teaching, and we're going to be blown away by it. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about deep false teaching that was causing division at the time, that was pulling apart the church of God and, and, and separating it. That's what Paul is talking about there, heavy um, heavy winds of false teaching. He says, but you're going to be so tied together that that's not going to be able to pull you apart. And continues on, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, a mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And if you put it in Paul's terms in chapter 2, we're becoming this temple of God that's being a light to the world, that's showing people what God is like and inviting people to come experience his presence in community. With the end goal being in verse 16, it says, From him, the whole body, through Christ, if Christ is at our center, we, we, we are a community that have all given ourselves to him, have pledged allegiance to him as king. When we all do that, put Christ at the center, it kind of grows outward. It says, the joined and held together by every supporting ligament, and grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All right, when the foundation is right, it's centered on Christ, Build upon the unity that is given us to us through the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives, the church will grow in all kinds of ways. Right? We're gonna, we will see the multiplying that so often emphasis is given to, but we're also going to see fruit, fruits of the Spirit, bear itself out in the lives of us in our own community. And we're going to see the life-giving nature of what the church is intended to be. Now, Here's where I want to go as we wrap this lesson up. First, to acknowledge this from what we've seen in the text today, is that in order to be conformed to the image of Christ, again, easier way to say that, in order to be like Jesus, so in order to be conformed to the image of Christ, which should be all of our goal as individuals, you need to be connected to the body of Christ. As I read through Scripture, I don't understand any other way than to be deeply invested in community. That doesn't mean there's not certain times where you separate yourself from one community and join yourself to another, but we were designed uniquely for community. It doesn't mean we don't take a break from a certain time and come back, but we were designed to be in community. And so in order to be conformed to the image of Christ, you need to be connected to the body of Christ in a real, raw way in which we share ourselves and share our lives with other people. We need to be radically, or we need to radically engage in life, worship, and service with one another. Right, uh, in our young adult class today, we talked about different impressions we get as, as children and what it means to be faithful or what it means to, to seek after God. And, and young adult after young adult shared like, well, I, I heard it was attendance. Like, it just seemed like it was always attendance, attendance, attendance. And that so misses the point of what it means to follow Jesus. It's, that, it's, it's, it's as if when we get to heaven one day and... The Lord says to us, well done, my good and faithful servants. And then he's going to enter into this ceremony where he passes out the good attendance cards or the perfect attendance cards, as if that's what heaven's going to be like. And the fact is we've, not made, we've made it too much about attendance and not enough about participation, about really truly engaging in life, worshiping, and service with one another. And as we think about all the ways that we engage... <coughs> There's no other way for us to grasp what it means to be the one another community than for us to be deeply engaged in participating in a local church. Attendance is involved in that, but we're not striving for perfection. 
We're not looking for someone with perfect attendance. We're looking for someone who's deeply in participation and fellowship with one another. That's the goal. That's what we're looking for when we think about being the one another community. And we are so thankful for all the ways that we're able to participate here at Northeast. We're, We're thankful for our live stream, for the ways in which people who are perhaps unable to be here are able to join in with us and still experience community. It's such a blessing as that came about kind of with so many churches as it came about during the pandemic. Such a blessing for those who are unable to attend because of health reasons and they feel isolated at times, you know, know, as one of the ministers and other elders and so many of our other members, they go out and they visit with those members and those members are hurting. It, It deeply hurts them that they can't be a part of this community because of their compromised health. They want to be. But as we look at the, at the live stream and we realize so many people have been connected to this church even who, who weren't connected before because they tuned in online. It is such a wonderful tool to reach out to the world for people to experience. And, and another side blessing when we go on vacations. I know so many of us will still tune in and get to see what's going on here in Northeast even when we're traveling. It's, it's a true blessing. But as I think about growing trends and isolation and loneliness in America, one of the things that has been brought forth um, is as the church attendance, and and again, that's not our goal, our goal is participation, but across America, as that has declined, there's been a rise in loneliness and other issues that have gone on in people's life. And and people are asking and questioning, is, is there a correlation there? And there's a a rise in less participation in in-person service, and there's a rise in live streaming services and those type of things as people will come, join in the community, uh, but they're not present among us, and so that relationship isn't always reciprocal. And so to those, if, we, if I'm talking to someone, maybe you've been tuning in for a while, you haven't been part of this community. I don't discourage you at all. I hope you keep tuning in. I hope you keep being part of this community in the way that you're comfortable with at this point. But I just want you to know, when you're ready, that we would love for you to be here with us, to join into this community, that there's a community waiting here that wants to know you and to love you when you're ready. Now, to those who are here, or are, in, are in person, or able to be here in person, I want to challenge you, because this is important for us, that because the goal is not, as we have said, the goal is not attendance, right? The goal is participation. We all know that you can be present, but you're not really present. You can be here, but you're not really here. And that's uncomfortable sometimes to be present and to be here, to be involved. And we all have our off days. We all have days where we're hurting and and we're, we're not ready to open up. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, but in the long run, in the trajectory of your relationship with God, you need to continually Give yourself radically as you engage in the life, worship, and service of the one another church. And now before we end, I want to wrap this up and ask this question once again. As we ask this as individualists, it's not a bad question, it's just a misdirected question. Will this church serve my needs? Because that's a question we all ask when we come to a local church. And, And again, it's not a bad question. I would just wonder if perhaps there's a better question, is when we come to church, we come and align ourselves with a local church, maybe we need to be asking this question. Will this church empower me to meet the needs of others? My needs are important, yes, we need to, and there's something to say about that. We need to be a part of a community where we're able to love, but we're also to be loved. But we also need to be a part of communities with the other emphasis as well, where we're not just only loved, but we're called to love well. And we're called to be a part of something radical, something bigger than ourselves. We need to be a place that are both. And we hope that we are that for you in Northeast. And, and we want to continue to grow into that as we are family, we're community. We want to continue to, to, to venture into deeper fellowship. That's the whole idea of life groups. Is in here is to get out of the big crowd and to get around a table, sit in a living room with other brothers and sisters who meet here in Northeast and to Invest more because we're truly better together because that's the way God designed it. We were created to be a light to the world, but we do, we're able to shine such a brighter light as we come together as a community as opposed to an individual. And if you're here this morning 
and you want to be a part of that community. You want to pledge your allegiance to King Jesus. You want to become a part of what he's doing in the world as he's building the church up as the temple of God to be uh, a, a lighthouse of God's goodness to the world. And you want to do that this morning. We invite you to respond when we sing in just a moment. If you want to exit, if you want to, if you want to respond privately, you can exit over here towards the Kidman Wing on the first classroom on your left. And there'll be an elder there if you want to chat with them about how, how do I begin that relationship? How do I plug into Jesus, be connected with him, be connected with his church? Or if you want to respond publicly, you can do that as well. Please come as we stand and while we sing.